submission is a dance, right? So in every dance, you've got a person who is in the lead and a person who is being submissive. And at the end of the dance, you don't declare one person the winner. Asking, um, or Raj asking me to forgive him. Who asks const- more than the other? Do you mind me asking? <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us for another episode of Bethel Backstage. My name is Steve DeWitt, and uh, I am joined here today uh, by some very dear sisters in the Lord who have agreed to uh, share with us today about the gospelized wife. You know, we are in our family month at Bethel Church. Our theme is the gospelized family. We're talking about how the gospel shapes Uh, the culture of our home and the culture of our hearts, and specifically, this weekend we've been talking about uh, the wife, the role of the wife, and how the gospel shapes the the wife in her uh, wonderful and critically important roles within the home. And so I'm going to ask each of these to introduce themselves to you and to share about uh, their who their husband is and their family as they might like. So uh, Rebecca, how about if we start with you? I'm Rebecca Saladry. I'm married to Raj, and we just celebrated our 38th wedding anniversary. We have two kids, two adult kids. I'm Lori Tabor. Um, I'm married to Wes. We've served with Life and Messiah um, our entire married life, a ministry bringing the gospel to Jewish people. Um, this May, it will be 45 years, which is shocking to me. Um, I have four grown kids, all married, thankfully all walking with the Lord, great great family, um, and nine grandchildren. Eight of them are boys, and they are three to 12 years old. I am Rachel Smith, and I've been married for five and a half years to my husband, Mark, and we go to the Crown Point campus. We have three children, uh, four, almost three, and eight months. Super. Well, we've got a range here of uh, years of experience, and that probably will shape some of our uh, our comments here today. I got to say, though, I, I feel like I'm on an episode of The View, uh, and I, I'm not sure what that means, but that's how I feel. I am honored, though, to uh, facilitate our, our conversation here, and we just want you to know our desire is to... Uh, uh, to be a blessing and to allow the lives and testimonies of uh, these women to to be a blessing to you. So let's talk about uh, the gospelized wife. And uh, our premise is that the gospel shapes everything that we do and who we are, and um, that this has included our the, the being a wife. So just a general question, how as you look at your own experience as a, as a wife, how has the gospel or a recognition of uh, reenacting the role of the church and the relationship with Jesus, how has this shaped your wifery? So being a gospelized wife or the gospel impacting me and my role as a wife, I would think is it takes the pressure off of um, me <laughs> on a day-to-day basis because with the gospel – my marriage can breathe. And there, you know, if, if I don't have the gospel and I'm a non-Christian um, wife and I don't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the blessed hope of his return, then my marriage has to be everything, right? Like it has to be the end all and I better be happy. And I've got to fight for every single um, bit of responsibility and ownership in marriage. We've got to keep up with the Joneses. We need to go on the vacations and have the date nights. And it has to be uh, all-consuming because we need to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die because when we die, it's all over, right? But the gospel is life-giving to my marriage because it changes the role of just husband and wife to also brother and sister in Christ, right? So that is an eternal, um, everlasting relationship that I share with Mark versus just husband and wife, right? So in thinking about how the gospel fuels that in day-to-day and the practical part of it, it goes from being a constant introspective, what did he mean by that? What did I mean by that? You know, chess game constantly, who's winning? To instead of face-to-face, we are now shoulder-to-shoulder advancing in the kingdom work for uh, Christ and his kingdom one day. And so it all matters. It's all redeemable. Every single interaction and conversation and mountaintop and valley, it has a redemptive quality to it because we are brother and sister in Christ. And I know that kind of probably sounds weird to people who are not um, churched or, you know, uh, on that path, but 
it is everlasting and it matters. Every conversation matters. Otherwise, it's just it's wood, hay and stubble and it burns up in the end. Um, but I have the opportunity to, however it plays out, see Mark one day in heaven, stand before God and the perpetual stare, right, Pastor Steve, of marriage and the sanctification process. Um, I have a chance to help him sharpen him and he can sharpen me to where we can give Jesus crowns and he is deserving of the glory um, of that everlasting relationship and that redeemable, everything being redeemed in the end because of the gospel. But without it, it's it evaporates and it's nothing. I love that statement you said at the beginning where you said, it allows my, my marriage to breathe. And, uh, you know, uh, your comments, I think of two, two things that C.S. Lewis said where uh, he talks about first things and, uh, and second things. And the only way you can enjoy a, a second thing is if you don't make it a first thing. And marriage is... Uh, is a, is a wonderful second thing and a horrible first thing. And if you make it the, your entire identity and all your hope is in the happiness of your marriage, it will suffocate it. Uh, the other thing that Lewis said is that um, because of Jesus, friendships are forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, that truth is wonderful in a Christian marriage that marriage doesn't go on, but the relationship in Christ does forever indeed. So, uh, well, we have our more seasoned wives. Uh, I wonder if uh, you want to just pick that up and, and run, run with I that. I have a completely sl or a slightly different take from Rachel. The gospel changed me practically because literally it was through my husband I came to know Jesus Christ as a living Savior. So for me, it was it's just the realization every day of I'm a sinner needing to be forgiven by God and I'm married to a sinner who needs to be forgiven. So our marriage has been constantly over the years, if I think many, many times of me asking Raj to forgive me or asking, um, or Raj asking me to forgive him. Who and asks more than the other? Do you mind me asking? <laughs> constantly just reminding myself that, I mean, the minute I wake up in the morning, I'm needing to ask my Savior to forgive me because I've done one more thing that's not right in his sight. So for me, the gospelized marriage is just really showing how God has forgiven me personally and being able to extend that. And I, I wish we had time to tell your amazing story of uh, growing up in India and how Raj's testimony, how God used that not only to bring you to, to Christ, but then also to bring you to Raj. And <laughs> that is a, a amazing story. We don't have time to get into it in this in this uh, broadcast. But uh, Lori, what, how would you... For me, it's about knowing and being known. Um, first of all, I have to know who I am in Christ. Who did Christ create me to be? Um, and how do I live that out in my life? And then because I'm very aware of who Christ created me to be, I'm, I'm a willing to be vulnerable to let Wes know me, to really know my inner struggles and my thoughts and, and all of those things, which truly makes us partners um, in, in life, in, in everything that we do. Hmm. And we, more than most couples, are together 24-7. So Yeah, you better, we, we better, really get, better along. get along. We really better get along. Well, that's great. Um, a comment to make uh, if, you're, if you're watching this is that we're talking about Christian marriage here, and each of these women are married to a Christian, and uh, and that's great. But we also recognize that that's not always the case. And so in a couple of weeks, we're going to actually have a, an entire Sunday talking about what do you do when the gospel is not evident at home? Maybe it's your parents aren't Christians, or maybe it's your spouse isn't a Christian. How do you how do you gospelize a home where you're the only one who believes it? So that's, that's upcoming. Uh, but for today, to talk about Christian marriage, one of the things that uh, a Christian marriage, as Paul says in Ephesians 5, is that we have this whole reenacting of Jesus in the church. And as much as we admire uh, Jesus, um, when we look at the church in that reenactment, there is a relationship there that uh, is seeing the husband as the, you know, reenacting Jesus. And so as a wife, to relate to a husband whose calling is to, is to lead and to lead in love and to be the servant leader. Uh, all husbands do that very imperfectly, 
and I'm sure you would say we wives do that imperfectly on our side, but let's talk about this because this is something in our culture that is, is I think, viewed largely negatively. You know, we see it as a glorious thing because we understand the gospel, but uh, it's maybe a bad word in, uh, in our culture. Uh, how should a wife view that, and what if, how has God maybe uh, freed you to uh, have joy in, in that calling? I think that, um, you know, when you're thinking about the reenactment part, I think the women have the much easier uh, role there, truly, because, you know, you're thinking about Jesus and all that he did for the church to redeem his bride, and we being dead in our sins, being made alive to Christ, dead, able to do nothing, (laughs) right? Like, so our role in submission and acceptance, I think, is much easier than the task that the husband has. And submission becomes a dirty word in the world because they reject the Genesis account, right? So they don't have a fundamental understanding that fallen Eve says, I want to have mastery over the man and I want to rule over my husband, right? And so the fact that they're even pushing against submission is proving God's word and um, showing exactly what God said was going to happen. And I don't say that in a, uh, I'm better than that um, in but any it, way. It is a function of the gospel right. to see that on, as a as a honorable and a, a right. virtuous thing, right. right, right, and submission being uh, submission is a dance, right. So in every dance, you've got a person who is in the lead and a person who is being submissive. And at the end of the dance, you don't declare one person the winner. the The husband or the man doesn't say, "Oh, I won that." You know, you either win or you lose together um, in that relationship. And so the functionality of submission always it always goes to a conversation of value. Who, oh, well, is the woman actually valued? And anybody who reads and understands scripture and the biblical accounts knows that Jesus values women. Uh, He came from a woman. Um, We are made in the image of Christ. And in almost every biblical account, a woman is in the picture at some point. So it's not a question of value, but it always goes to that conversation of, well, if if you're being submissive, then you're the less valued one. But if it's a dance and if at the end of it we win and lose based off of the functionality of there always has to be a lead and there always has to be a submitted one, the person who leads is showing the glory off of the person who is submissive, right? Um, So it's not about value. It's about how are we functioning together and who would know how better to say it and how we should be than the one who created us and would know what is best for us. And Jesus does all things well. And we, we trust that. Uh, Jennifer and I in our in our marriage, you know, when we're having conflict, one of the things that we remind ourselves of is that we're in the canoe together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the dysfunction, if you ever canoed with people, like right. if, if <laughs> the canoe goes over, yeah. you're both going over. Right. And it's in our own best interest to to dance and to um, to do that to do that well. And so um, Lori, Rebecca, thought that. for me, so much of submission is in the words that I choose to use. Um, you know, Wes has told me many times, I will go to the ends of the earth to help you. But if I feel like you're telling me what to do, it just, that doesn't go well. Hmm. And so I've, I've learned a, a quick example is, you know, if I say the garbage needs to go out, it's the implied is it's your job, take it out. As opposed to if I say, would you mind helping me take the garbage out? It's very simple little slight change, but it makes all the difference in the world. And in that speaking kindly, you know, I've heard that sometimes um, women tend to be more forgiving of their friends and speak more kindly and think the best of, of friends than their spouse. And so I think that is, for me, um, showing that submission part in how do I speak? What words do I use? Do I think the best? Right, because you don't go to work and, you know, blow up with your boss right. or your coworkers. Or tell them what to do. Yeah, if you can think of a nice way or a, you know, a tender way of saying something to them and confronting them in a workplace, then we can do it at home. We didn't get married to fight, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, striving for unity and peace yeah. in your marriage, not yeah. just in the workplace or the church. Yeah. I, I've also... I'm, I'm the only husband in the in this uh, in this table here, but I think that uh, you know questions mm-hmm. are are much more are received much better than yeah. than statements, right? And uh, that's a way to kind of open the heart to mm-hmm. to you know for a husband to it's less threatening yeah. and is a I think a, a wise way to to do it. So yeah. Rebecca, any thought on that you want to share? I 
I obviously come from a culture where submission as the wife is taught as a child. And it was really important when we got married to see that I needed to submit. And I didn't look at it like the bad word in the world today. I looked at it more as I'm a helper and encourager for Raj to do what he has to do, mm -hmm. especially because in my case, I didn't know how a godly home is being led. So the best way for me was to submit to him and be an encourager cheering him on so he does what God's called him to, and I'm doing what God's called me to. Mm -hmm. It's beautifully mm -hmm. said. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, an interesting question I want to ask uh, each of you. Uh, we have some more, or one more uh, married less amount of time. We've got a few married a little longer. Uh, if you could go back to the days before you got married, like you could time warp back and give advice to yourself about being a wife based on what you know now at this point, what would you, what would you tell yourself? My first piece of advice I would have given myself is to make sure that I'm being mentored by someone who's walked this walk mm -hmm. so I can learn from somebody who's done this before. I think I didn't do that. I'm thankful to God that he led me, but I think if I had done that right in the beginning, things would have gone a lot easier, especially for somebody like me who was a new believer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always had that in my life, and it's so valuable. Um, and a godly mother. I know yeah. your family story. Yeah, yeah. So what a blessing that is yeah. to see it and yeah. grow yeah. up with it. Um, I think I would, if I was to go back, I would say you are created to be Wes's cheerleader, his lover, his companion, his partner, all of those things, but you are not his mother. And I think especially when you have little kids, you tend to, mm. you know, tell your kids, you know, go clean your room, go do your homework, go, you know, do whatever. And that can easily transfer to how we talk to our husbands. And that is not our job. And that's where the asking questions goes a lot farther than little commands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you get more, you get the bear with the, with yeah. the honey more than the bee, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't have to go as far back in time. Um, but I think the thing I would tell myself would be don't make ungracious assumptions about mm -hmm. uh, my spouse and what he thinks. Being that uh, I think women, um, the battle is won and lost in our minds. And um, I think in the beginning, I really did make ungracious assumptions, you know, things like, you know, he, I bet he wishes he didn't marry me or I'm not good enough or I know he meant something vindictive by that, right? Um, but giving gracious assumptions to him and thinking the best about him. And if I could tell myself, I would tell, you married a really good man and just believe mm -hmm. the best because yeah. life will give you enough um, negative and valleys to where you don't need to create phantoms and fight mm -hmm. things that are not there. Um, but we like to create these, <laughs> these, you know, battles in our mind. And when he comes home, you know, it's ready for war when it doesn't have to be. Um, and it's not true. And the un ungracious assumptions just need to go away. And I need to be as gracious and loving and believe the best because, yeah. um, he is a good man and he doesn't have to prove it nonstop, you know, to me. Hmm. Well said. All right. I'm just going to open it up. Any other practical tips? Uh, for being a, uh, a, a godly Christian wife to your husband? We talk a lot about assumptions, desires, and expectations. We call them ADEs. Um, and I find that any time that I find myself being frustrated or angry or whatever, you know, think of a negative emotion, it's generally because I have an unmet and maybe unrecognized assumption, desire, or expectation. If I find myself saying, I wish you had, or I thought you would, or those kinds of things, um, that's pretty much an ADE. And if I can think in advance and realize what my ADEs are and take those to the Lord and surrender them there, and I'm not perfect at that by any means, but being aware of it has really helped. Hmm. I, I have uh, just an observation too. So many times when uh, Jennifer and I get um, crosswise, it is the very point that you're making. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, I thought you were going to do this yeah. or be right. home here or, yeah. you know, be – and communication on the front end right. can right. sure yeah. – you know, a little medicine on the front end takes care of the, yeah. the disease on the back end. And uh, sharing those on, uh, on the front is, is certainly yeah. helpful. Yeah. So, Rebecca? 
I would just say when I want to see any change in my husband or my marriage, my first defense has always been just take it to the Lord because mm -hmm. he's the only one who can change. Uh, by me nagging Raj, it's never worked and never will work. But by me pleading with the Lord, it's always worked. Mm -hmm. Hmm. He's changed me or changed him. Hmm. The power of a praying wife. Well, I, I want to thank uh, each of you for uh, for joining here. A little vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that as well. I think we relate uh, mostly to each other's struggles more than our you know our wins or successes. And so, thank you for uh, sharing. And I thank your husbands for. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you talk to them about, <laughs> hey, are you okay if I go on camera about our marriage? <laughs> but thank them uh, for us and uh, everyone joining here. Thank you for, for joining. And the whole month of, uh, of January at Bethel Church is intended to, to bless your family and to equip all of our families. We're all in the struggle together to honor Christ, bring glory to Jesus and the gospel. So may you have a very gospelized week. Thanks for joining us.